Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Debakey uh, Heart and Vascular Institute Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Mohammed Chamsi Pasha from the Cardiovascular Imaging Section. And before we introduce our speaker, uh, a few housekeeping items would like to bring it up. We are broadcasting live on uh, live stream and YouTube, and please use the microphone when asking questions. The recording is always available for viewings after and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel to get notifications when videos are added. And for our viewers, if you would like to submit a question, text DEBAKEY, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607, and you may also submit your questions via live stream feed. Find the video on livestream.com forward slash HMH dash EDU. We have two conferences coming up in June the pre-intern training for vascular residents coming up between June the 5th and the 7th, and the cardiology for the non-cardiologists on June the 17th. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our grand round speaker today, Dr. James Thomas, professor of medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, who currently serves as the director for the Center for Heart Valve Disease and Academic Affairs in the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and has a leadership role for the Center for Artificial Intelligence in Cardiovascular Disease while serving. Dr. Thomas was born and raised in Oklahoma City. He attended Harvard College 1977, graduated in Applied Mathematics and Harvard Medical School in 1981 before clinical training at the Mass General Hospital and the University of Vermont. Dr. Thomas has published over 650 peer-reviewed publications with an H index of 142. He, along with Dr. Zogby, are the past presidents of the American Society of Echocardiography, and he previously served on the cardiovascular board for the American Board of Internal Medicine. He also serves as lead scientist for ultrasound with NASA, focusing on the effects of space on cardiovascular function. Having been at the Cleveland Clinic for many years before moving to Northwestern University, Dr. Thomas has formed a two-year fellowship in advanced cardiovascular imaging and another one offering a master's degree in artificial intelligence, which is the scope of our uh, grand round topic today, collaborating with engineers and scientists in the, uh, on the Evanston campus. Dr. Thomas will be talking about how ECHO will thrive with artificial intelligence. Please welcome Dr. Thomas for today's Grand Rounds, and thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Great. Well, thanks so much, Muhammad. And uh, I should point out that uh, Muhammad comes from a very proud lineage of uh, cardiovascular specialists. Uh, his father is um, uh, an echocardiographer, cardiologist in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, who has hosted me and Bill Zogby uh, several times over there. I've even been in your house and seen all your, your father's artwork and books that he has written and uh, truly a, a renaissance man. But I'm delighted to, uh, to be here with uh, friends, uh, Bill Zogby, Steve Little, uh, all the rest of the uh, DeBakey crew down here. And I, I really do think that we are, we are venturing into a new phase of our life as cardiovascular imagers. Um, we will, uh, uh, over the next 10 years, artificial intelligence will entrain itself into our work habits in ways that you may not even realize. And so without further ado, let's, let's jump in a little bit. Now, I, an earlier version of this talk spoke about physics versus gestalt. And uh, you all are very familiar with physics in um, um, echocardiography and cardiovascular imaging in general. And there obviously is a lot of physics in echocardiography, and you can't get away from that. Physics is going to be driving what's going on in our, our images there. But there's also this thing called gestalt. That's really what AI depends on. Gestalt, if you look it up in the dictionary, is an organized whole that is perceived as more than the sum of its parts. Let's look at an example of what, how that might manifest itself. <clears throat> this is one of the early uh, uh, studies 
um, uh, published by David Oyang, who's a very uh, uh, visionary leader in AI in cardiovascular imaging there. And what he did was to take 2,800 echo studies, 2.6 million echo images, and did a very simple training exercise through a, a convolutional neural network, just labeling these images with the sex of the patient, the height, the weight, the age, and then tested it on several hundred more echoes like that and showed a remarkable ability. I mean, imagine you look at an echo, can you tell whether it's a man or a woman? Can you tell how old they are? Can you tell what, what their height is? Well, he could predict uh, sex with a very high predictive accuracy, uh, very strong predictive accuracy on weight, age, and uh, then this uh, grad cam image here shows what features the AI is looking at to give you these, these guesses. And it's, it shows that like age is driven a lot by annular calcification. Weight is driven by how much space there is between the chest wall and, and the uh, apex. The actual algorithm itself is undefined. It just knows this. It looks at it and says, yeah, that's a 70 year old woman who's five foot four. And it's usually pretty right. So the beginning of artificial intelligence goes all the way back to 1955 where there was a proposal to have a two month tin man because of course it would be tin men back in 1950, this would be 56 when they held it <coughs> at Dartmouth College and they brought together, yes, a, a fine looking lot of gentlemen there and um, here they are 50 years later when they all uh, um, had a uh, little bit of a uh, revisit of this. And if you look at the components of the program, this could fit into an artificial intelligence uh, coursework in 2023. In particular, look, they were talking about neural networks back in 1956. And this had grown from a, uh, uh, some very detailed histopathology uh, performed by uh, mainly on retinas. This is uh, uh, the the um, uh, horse, the um, uh, uh, soft shell crab here, looking at its eyeball there, and identifying that there are ways that these retinal neurons respond to images that come in that will highlight certain orientations of lines. And so this would identify a vertical line where you, you uh, um, uh, add up these uh, neuronal weightings in the way you see them. Don't need to get into the deep weeds, but through a very complex interweaving of all these neurons, you can be sensitive to lines, to edges, to movement, um, and all kinds of sort of higher level input that then goes into the brain for interpretation. Now here's a brief history of artificial intelligence and computational neural networks. Hang on tight. 60s, it was up. 70s, it was down. 80s, it was up. And in fact, in uh, 1983 or so, I think we saw the, the first company dedicated to producing hardware optimized for artificial intelligence called Symbolics uh, Incorporated. Actually, my uh, college roommate worked for them out of college. Um, and uh, fun fact, this was the very first dot com registered in the internet on March 15th, 1985. So that was the beginning of all of that. It was riding high in the mid to late 80s. Unfortunately, there was only a finite market for them of about a thousand machines. Once they sold a thousand machines, there was no more market and just boom. And so it collapsed in the early 90s. If you look at the keyboard, it has English, Greek, and math symbols on it. So it was quite ahead of its time. Um, so down in the 90s, up in the aughts, and then way up in the last 10 years. And let's look at why that was. There were basically three big factors that happened around 2012 that really made AI uh, take off. The rise of graphical processing units, something called ImageNet, and a guy named Alex Krzyzewski. Let's uh, explore how each of those contribute to this. Now, this fellow here, Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, 
way back in 1965, spoke about cramming more components onto integrated circuits. And you can see he, he had quite a, an extrapolation from four data points here, extending it out to, uh, in this case, only 1975. Well, here we are in 2023, and his prediction that computer power will double every 12 to 24 months um, has really maintained its, its, uh, its truth over all of that time there. I like this cartoon in, the, um, in this paper here where they had handy home computers right next to the notions in cosmetics there, because what could be sillier than having a home computer? Um, and so here is Gordon Moore's law sort of extrapolated back to 1900 and then all the way to the present. And it looks like pretty much a straight line if we look over the last, say, 40 years, uh, before about 2010, this was all driven by improvements in central processing units, cramming more transistors onto, onto regular computer processing units there. And then about 2010, something called a graphical processing unit uh, came along, and this was really optimized for doing a lot of parallel process processing doing many operations at the same time. And though it doesn't look like much happened, those lines aren't that different from each other. In fact, they represent about a 20-fold uh, increase in speed because this is a logarithmic scale. Now, ImageNet, one of the things that you need in artificial intelligence is millions of examples. And what ImageNet did, it started gathering pictures of everything. And it literally, when I pulled this down, it had 14,197,000 images, uh, all of them labeled. This is a cat. This is a Persian cat. This is, you know, down and down in the, in the depths there. But it can be used to train these algorithms, as you'll see. And they used to sponsor a contest every year called the Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. And they would get 150,000 images to train on, 50,000 to refine their, their uh, process, and then 1,000 images to test. And then they would present their, their, um, their results. And you can see that through 2010, 11, and 12, they, they were kind of pretty good, but you know they still had a 25 to 45 percent error rate on these. And then this guy, Alex Krzyzewski, took advantage of a new type of architecture, a very deep, very broad convolutional neural network fueled by GPUs. And in one year, he dropped from like 25 percent error down to 15 percent error. Um, and uh, really revolutionized the field, showed that there were so many um, new techniques that could be applied to this. Over the next five years, it just got better and better and better till it finally got to the point there was no, no reason to have the contest anymore because it was essentially perfect. Um, now let's get some definitions out of the way. Um, artificial intelligence in its broadest term is a computer program that has some ability to think, whatever that means. Machine learning is where you create rules for computers to learn from data. And then the most exciting one here is deep learning. And that is where networks learn like humans do. They take examples from mass data and just figure it out. And it all relies on an enormous amount of data being fed into the beast here. And this sort of stands aside over here, but it's a prerequisite for any proper AI work. Now, there are two, two broad categories of artificial intelligence that use either supervised or unsupervised learning. Supervised means that you have put labels on things. You have said, this is a cat, this is a dog. Um, so that um, uh, when it runs through millions of these examples, it will gradually over time get better and better and eventually it'll figure out this is a dog, this is a cat. Unsupervised learning uses unlabeled data. So you learn to organize or make sense out of data without any explicit labels. 
Uh, and just to show you a simple example of that, someone hands you a bunch of change. You don't know anything about a penny or a nickel or a quarter, but you can say, well, this is different from that, and I can form four different piles of these. And uh, that is essentially what unsupervised learning is able to do. In imaging, most of the stuff we work with is supervised or labeled data there. There are a variety of sort of classical, I call them shallow learning models that are actually more sophisticated than simple regression here. Uh, won't go into these in any detail, but they are able to take complex data and characterize it in ways uh, that we perhaps never had the ability in the past. Now, deep learning. Here is the cartoon version. I am grateful to my colleague, Akil Narang, for providing pictures of his son here as he has uh, trained his own convolutional neural network. If you look at enough penguins, enough movies and cartoons about penguins, you learn to recognize a penguin. And uh, at the end, you can tell, well, this dog sort of looks like a penguin, but it's not a penguin. This is a penguin. And uh, this version of deep learning always struck me like this old cartoon in the New Yorker where they, they have the mathematical proof, and in the middle it says, then a miracle occurs. And he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So let's take a couple of minutes. I promise you we'll get back into practical applications in imaging. But just to understand a little bit of the mathematics behind this, I will try to make this as painless as possible. Uh, but it's, you know, it's deep stuff. So deep learning essentially solves regression equations by the billions, trillions, quintillions. Um, we're all familiar with linear regression. I mean, this, uh, this institute should have um, uh, great familiarity with this graph, uh, where you find two parameters, slope and intercept, to predict wedge pressure from E over E prime. This is simple linear regression. We can have nonlinear regression, where we use a curve that is not a straight line. And we can have multivariate regression, where you have more than one variable going into a prediction. And all of these work by minimizing the cost or the aggregate error in the estimates there. And we're all pretty comfortable with this. Um, for a neural network to recognize a dog in a photo, let's say dog versus wolf. So you feed thousands, tens of thousands of images in there and you have a convolutional neural network. This is millions of nodes all connected to each other with certain weightings that will uh, look for edges and, and movement and things like that. And the first time you run it through your test set, it's going to be lousy. It's going to be terrible because these are just sort of generic weightings that are used there. So if you plotted an air, a uh, receiver operator curve, the dog-wolf error rate would have an AUC of maybe 0 0.5001. That is just indistinguishable from flipping a coin. And then you go back and do it again. And you adjust these weights to lower the cost. Now, what does that actually mean? Let's look at a simple example. This is two parameters we're trying to optimize, not the eight million that you may have in your model. Just two. You're hiking in the mountains and you want to reach the bottom. You want to optimize the latitude and longitude to minimize your elevation. And you know, normally you'd say, well, it's right over there. I can see it. But the problem is it's foggy in the mountains and you can't see more than a few feet around you. So you can't see the distant destination. All you see is the local information as to where the, the slope is going. And so to do this, you want to do something to lower this aggregate error rate. And all you can do is take a step down the hill. Just figure out where the steepest part of that slope is and take a step down the hill and start to, uh, to optimize this. And you can see, you know, if red and blue are different features, as we go down this slope here, we will get closer to the correct cutoff here. 
And so after you do that enough times, you've optimized, and maybe now you can say, there's a 99.7% chance that this is a dog. It's an angry dog, but it's still a dog. Now, that's kind of artificial intelligence 101. The real art of artificial intelligence is something called hyperparameters. I'm not gonna get into all of this, but this is really where people with insight can choose different ways of doing this error reduction there to get better results. And let's just look at a couple of hyperparameters that can be set. We, get, we have control over the overall algorithm architecture, the number of layers, the number of nodes, the number of clusters. Uh, we can look at the learning rate. This is how big of a step do you take down the hill? If you take too small a step, it'll take you forever to get down there. And when you multiply this by like a quadrillion, it's going to take forever to optimize your, your neural network. Uh, if you have too high of a step, you may just bounce back and forth across the canyon and you'll never optimize it. So there is a sweet spot here where you will take little steps down the hill there. And then finally, there's, there's uh, depending on how much memory you have, you're not going to be able to hold all of your images at one time. So you do these in batches and there's actually a lot of s secret sauce in how you plan out your batching there. Now, this is important. You've got an original data set that you're doing your whole project on. You've got a training set, and then you often see that we did training and then we did validation. Now, to cardiologists, validation means, well, we tested it and it worked. That is not what it means in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence means that we have refined it and validated that it's ready for testing. And you still have to have an independent test set that the algorithm has never seen to have any confidence that you've really got something valuable. So validation equals development does not equal proof. Only test equals proof. And sometimes you read a paper, you realize, okay, you've only gone through the first two steps. You didn't have an independent testing set, and ideally it would be from a different institution, maybe a different country, so that you really had confidence that you had generalized knowledge in this. Because you want to avoid two types of, uh, of bias here. You don't want to underfit, where there's just uh, too many um, of the other type falling on different sides of the line there. And you don't want to overfit where you have made the model so complex that it captures every single outlier there, but then it is not going to be robust. It's not going to work in general settings there. So why do we need AI and echocardiography? Well, there's a lot of variability in accuracy and quality of interpretations. This is a, a place where highly detailed, accurate uh, interpretations are given, but I'll bet you don't have to go too far from here to find places that are pretty shoddy in their, their reads there. It depends on the expertise of the operator. We want to do better quantitative analysis in 2D and 3D. We want to do disease detection and identification. Improve our efficiency. Accommodate a growing volume of studies get guidance of acquisition and automating protocols, and expand the availability of ultrasound to underserved areas. So translating echocardiography images into data actually is pretty simple because it starts out as data and it gets turned into images when we look at it. So this is, this is the easy part. And one of the early efforts in this is from uh, a uh, woman at San Francisco, Rima Arno and was just to recognize echocardiographic views by artificial intelligence and feed it a whole bunch of labeled images to say this is a parasternal long axis view, this is an apical four, this is a subcostal, and see, train it to, to recognize these. And indeed they could, and indeed they did better if they had video, if they had all the images from a given clip, and they actually did better than humans at recognizing the images there. Then um, how could this uh, be helpful? 
we were ta Steve Little and I were talking about this last night at dinner, and in in homage to Steve Lester, who's been speaking to us for the last 15 years, I think about reading in stacks. You want to have the ability to say, show me all the data relating to diastolic function. Find the best apical four and two chamber views and calculate the ejection fraction from these. While you're at it, toss in an apical long axis view and give me global longitudinal strain. Show me all clips with a visible proximal convergence zone. So there are many ways that this could help our life just to have those image recognized and sorted into uh, individual data sets. Now, real-time automated 3D transthoracic ejection fractions is now available on a lot of our clinical echo machines in, in the lab here. Here's, here's one from a commercial echo machine, and then here is one that has been developed by a commercial enterprise here, and really does better than human experts do. It performs like a panel of cardiologists would in grading the ejection fraction. I mentioned David Oyang previously. This was a paper, this was actually published in Nature, Big Boy Nature, the real top of the food chain there, uh, where he used a um, uh, treated all of the images from these loops here to calculate the ejection fraction and really showed remarkably good accuracy there and used that to have a blinded randomized control trial of sonographer versus artificial intelligence assessment of cardiac function. This was presented at last year's uh, ESC meeting. I was the uh, discussant for this and you can see us on stage there. And it was really a clever, uh, clever approach here. Basically, he took uh, 3,500 previous echoes. They had been read clinically a couple of years before, but they were reread with or without an artificial intelligence EF. So they come in uh, and they are divided into either just getting a sonographer read or getting the AI initial assessment read going on there. The key was they had to look the same. You couldn't tell, well, this is drawn with a red outline, so I know it's AI. Then the cardiologist read these, and the primary outcome was how frequently a cardiologist would change the given EF by more than 5%. And so I will tell you, these are three examples. So you can see the moving four chamber images in the middle there. The um, uh, images to the left and to the right are four and two chamber views, or no, uh, diastole and systole views here, one of which is traced by AI, the other traced by a sonographer. Can you tell which is which? Place your bets. Okay. I, for one, scored pretty poorly on this. It, it is really remarkable how well they were able to disguise which was doing that. And then when they went to look at the primary outcome, it turned out that for the sonographer tracings, the cardiologist changed <coughs> the proposed EF by more than 5%, 27% of the time, and the AI tracing only 16.8% of the time. Um, this, you know, the, the study was designed as a non-inferiority trial. Well, it's certainly non-inferior. In fact, it had a uh, P less than 0.001 for superiority that the, uh, the AI had much less overread corrections than the sonographers did. So really a very positive finding there. A guy named Rahul Deo, who's been working on the uh, one big project at the Brigham here, has developed an end-to-end -end assessment that can detect hokum, can detect amyloid, pulmonary artery hypertension, um, and uh, you know that is something that is still ongoing there. And strain imaging is increasingly automated. You see this on your, your own clinical echo machines. It just sort of goes out and finds the best images there and does these calculations, and there is that. Now, Given enough loops labeled with global longitudinal strain, we could probably estimate it by, by AI, but perhaps it's better to use the AI to find the right contours 
and then apply a deterministic algorithm, just the usual autocorrelation algorithm that we use for strain. You don't have to do everything by gestalt. Physics still has a point in these. Here's uh, from a, a company called Ultramics, an abstract showing the automated estimation of strain and ejection fraction during exercise. So showing the possibility this may be helpful in stress tests. Now can we just gestalt our way to imaging glory? Here is a cautionary tale from my own lab of PISA quantification. This, the oldsters here know that I've been passionate about proximal isovelocity surface areas for about 30 years. So here we are with our version of the uh, plastic dog in the background there, our in vitro model there. And uh, you can see we were recording proximal convergence zones. And uh, I sent several of these data sets to some colleagues up at main campus in Evanston there. They used the original AlexNet, Alex Krzyzewski, the, the guy that came up with this in the first place. And uh, they ran it through and then ran a test set. And oh my goodness, look at that. That is like better than sliced bread. Um, I thought, uh, you know, let's try a few more. So I sent them a few more data sets, three more data sets. Yeah, not so good. I mean, it's overestimating, it's underestimating, it's correlation is not so good. So what had happened here? The worst thing of these, these were all the same data sets. They were all exactly the same physical run of, the, of fluid through the in vitro model. The only thing that I did was to change the aliasing velocity when I exported these. Um, and the critical flaw was the first step these engineers did was to crop away the color bar. All right, well, you've just thrown away critical information. So with the color bar gone, there was no way to reconstruct the velocity. This worked fine as long as you had a constant color bar, but not when you changed it. So the lesson is you need both gestalt and physics to do the best job here. We're proceeding on this project, but we're keeping the color bar, or we're extracting the information. Now, this talk is focused on ECHO, but there's a lot of AI examples from other modalities. Let's just quickly go through a few of these. Here is um, using deep learning for prediction of obstructive disease from uh, the uh, myocardial perfusion SPECT exams. And you can see they used a, uh, uh, about 1,600 patients, um, deep learning trained with raw and quantitative polar maps. Um, they had a holdout 10% test set here, just as they should, and compared tissue perfusion deficit predictions to what the AI predicted, and there was a consistent improvement in uh, the estimates of ischemia based on uh, the machine er learning estimates as opposed to just the, the standard analysis. Um, this is using CT scanning here, integration prediction of lesion-specific ischemia from quantitative coronary CT using machine learning. Uh, had about 254 patients with CTA and CAF, FFRs in 484 vessels, went through the usual model building here, and again showed that uh, using the machine learning estimate, there was a better prediction of the FFR from these uh, examples than uh, uh, just using the visual assessment of that. Now this is a true physics versus gestalt battle to the finish here. You're familiar with uh, the heart flow uh, computational fluid dynamics quantification for coronary CTs. So you send out this uh, 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 coronary CT angiogram here, and it is simulated somewhere in California to get the FFR um, uh, estimates from all of these. They compared that result with just using characteristic specific lesion features uh, to try to predict the FFR. And 
fortunately, it was a, it was a tie. If you look very carefully in this lower right-hand corner here, there are two lines there. There's a red line and a green line, but they are literally superimposed on each other. So I would say the gestalt worked just as well as the physics. The physics worked just as well as gestalt. Maybe if we can find a way to work together, we can get further advances beyond that. Um, not much to say on magnetic resonance. This is having a major impact on quantification in uh, magnetic resonance here. Um, the, all kinds of things from the acquisition and planning the pulse sequences to uh, automated uh, analysis of uh, uh, T1 and T2 imaging. And, uh, and uh, it, it is something that finally, I think we're getting away from the little hand traced contours that I've been just stunned how long those have persisted in, um, in uh, uh, radiology. And then here's a deep learning based method for fully automated uh, quantification of the left ventricular function by Cine MR images there, and you can see these really do have superb results here uh, over the manual methods uh, that are really much more tedious. Now, commercial AI products are appearing. There are a lot of companies trying to break into this. Um, uh, a company named Ultramics has received FDA clearance for its AI-powered decision support system. This gives you EF and strain. A company called US2.AI has the ability to measure 60 measurements in two minutes. Essentially, every measurement we do in an echocardiogram, they can do in two minutes, just as the sonographer is finishing off the exam. And, and so these are really out there now. There are obviously AI options to analyze echoes once acquired. But what if you can't acquire the echoes in the first place? Places like emergency room or ICUs, chemo infusion centers, internist GP offices, the developing world, or COVID floors, as we discovered. In other words, is there a way to develop an echo GPS where you would get turn-by-turn -turn instructions that would allow you to to find the um, optimal view of the heart there. And in fact, there is. Uh, this is a, a company I've been working with for about eight years and um, full disclosure, my wife works for them. Um, but uh, we, they have been developing this AI guidance approach for quite a while. And the way it was done, I mean, it's very clever. They had a, a camera seeing how a sonographer would move the probe around and it would give the three-dimensional location of the probe and the three-dimensional orientation, which way it was pointing, and then compare it to the image that came out of that. And then also have a bunch of uh, expert sonographers and, and physicians to look at that to give quality assessments in about a half a million of those examples. And um, eventually fed it into this model um, and to develop a interface that looks like this, that has a quality meter, has the ideal image that you're going for, and a way of giving you turn-by-turn -turn instructions. Now, I point your attention to the size of this model. This is a 7.5 million parameter convolutional neural network optimized with over 7.2 exaflop. What's an exaflop? A flop is a floating point operation that's, uh, you know, multiplying two numbers together or something like that. An exaflop is 10 to the 18th or one quintillion floating point operations. So it is, they have a server room. It used to be in this little closet in San Francisco. They had to apply for extra air conditioning for the room so it wouldn't like melt down. It took two weeks running constantly to optimize this. And, but at the end, you end up with something like this where sonographer just kind of, okay, or not a sonographer, an MA. This has been shown to work with uh, medical assistants. There's the image you're looking for. Here's the image you've got. It says rotate counterclockwise slowly. Here's your, your uh, quality meter. Still not high enough, but when it gets above those two carats there, it says hold still 
and it will automatically save that image and then move the guidance on to the next image in the sequence. And it also gives you an uh, ejection fraction estimate that gets better the more images you feed it. So how was this clinically validated? Well, un unfortunately for the company, they, um, they thought they were going to get this through just as a 510K. For the first time in the entire history of diagnostic ultrasound, the FDA says, we got nothing. There's no predicate for this. You're going to have to do this as a de novo submission and do a full clinical trial to prove that it works. So we d designed a trial of 240 patients at Northwestern uh, and uh, Minnesota Heart Institute. We had eight echo-naive nurses who each scanned 30 patients each. Uh, the patients were balanced for BMI and presence of cardiac pathology. And you can see the images can be pretty good. These are obviously not the worst images produced in the trial, uh, but it was pretty good. Now, um, the uh, FDA mandated that we have quality images in at least 80% of cases so that a group of cardiologists could look at it and say, yes, I can assess LV size and function in this patient looking at the whole study there. Well, it turned out it was actually 98% patients that were diagnostic for left ventricular size and function, RV size a little lower but well over 80%, pericardial effusion um, was also at 98 plus percent. So the FDA authorized this with breakthrough status. It was named one of the time top 100 inventions for all of 2021. It received uh, INTAP status from CMS. That means INTAP is new technology add-on payment. That means you get a DRG bonus when you use this technology in the hospital. Uh, we've had four uh, devices deployed at, at Northwestern. Uh, we've also de-identified a lot of echoes during the process here that we're using for our own AI work. Um, and one place where we used this early on, this was approved just before COVID times, and we were trying to keep our sonographers out of the COVID ICUs and would have some of the PAs and, uh, and other folks who were already exposed in there uh, do these. Here's a, uh, a, a non-expert scan showing a small hyperdynamic LV, a dilated dysfunctional RV, and uh, she had had a valve and valve TMVR that you can see here, large IVC. And then here's a 72-year-old man with shock and respiratory failure, and he has a really extreme case of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy with contraction only in the basal 25% of the LV and the RV. Um, and uh, a recent review article in New England Journal identified uh, prescriptive imaging guidance as one of the uh, hallmarks in the progress of POCUS through the years. Now let's look at some other results of uh, various uh, AI algorithms in echocardiography. I mentioned the US 2.AI algorithm. Uh, I think now they can actually measure 60 parameters, but this was a recent uh, publication in Nature Communications uh, that used 602 echoes, um, and they used AI versus three sonographers who measured all of these parameters there. The agreement among the sonographers was compared to the AI agreement to the sonographer mean, and um, if it's if it's an even Steven split, they would all lie on this line here. But you can see for most of these measurements, the AI actually gave better, more consistent estimations than the three sonographers compared to each other there. So really something I think you could imagine this coming into your echo lab and, you know, taking 20 minutes away from the sonographer who has to measure all of these things there they can be moving on to the next patient and maybe get more efficiency out of the lab that way. Um, here is an attempt at using uh, AI to grade stress echocardiography. Shows really uh, quite dramatic separation of these curves here. Uh, it, uh, this trial was done in Britain, obviously had some flaws. Uh, only 24% had angiograms. 
Um, and if you didn't have an angiogram, you were assumed not to have coronary disease. So eh, maybe not. Um, but uh, anyway, you could see that um, uh, the expert reading was significantly better in this case. Uh, but adding uh, the ejection fraction or the GLS increase the C statistic. So I think there are ways to use these together um, that, uh, um, and they're, they're moving on to another trial now that I think has a little more comprehensive a design uh, that you can see here. Uh, this was published in um, uh, Jack Imaging last year and showed um, that the readers actually improved their area under the ROC curve. This was one, the design was you read it and you, either you got the AI guidance or you didn't. And if you got the guidance, you improved your uh, ROC curve quite significantly from this. So this may be the best way to do it, to give some, some recommendations and guidance. And then this is something, this is quite amazing. This is uh, FDA approved as of December 6th um, AI for HEFPEF from a single apical four-chamber view. Uh, HEFPEF, as you know, is notoriously difficult to diagnose um, with multiple studies showing sensitivity, you know, in maybe the 60 or 70 percent range. This Ultramix trial used a single four-chamber view but had 88 percent sensitivity and 83 percent specificity in the test set and identified 68% more HEFPEF patients than detected with clinical algorithms. Again, this has gotten FDA approval with breakthrough status, paves the way for this new technology add-on payment for inpatients, and there's also an outpatient out, uh, equivalent of that. Um, and, you know, you say, can I tell that that's HEFPEF? Well, it's not a normal heart. Uh, using the explainable AI, which identifies the features that show uh, what it's really focused on, suggests LA size, annular motion, and LVH are the key determinants that the algorithm is looking for. So I think time will tell if this really is, is going to be a breakthrough um, in, in this, uh, and it's moving into sort of broader clinical trials. So is this our fate? Are the robots going to replace us? Hardly. We believe in the concept of augmented intelligence. In 1997, Deep Blue defeated Garry Kasparov in chess, and it's only gotten more lopsided since. But still, a human plus a computer beats the best computer, which has led to the rather bizarre concept of Centaur's chess, which is a human plus a computer working together and doing battle with each other. And we see the same thing in medicine. Here's deep neural networks improving radiologists performing in performance in breast cancer screening. And you get significantly better when you combine the two uh, readers, AI and radiologists, together. Um, similarly, in skin cancer recognition, a bunch of dermatologists all over the world, 600 dermatology photos distributed. Individual readers had about a 65% accuracy. If you had collective readers, you had about a 74% accuracy. If you had the AI reader, you had a 77% accuracy. But if you put the AI plus the collective readers together, you had 81% accuracy. So really a dramatic improvement in this. And that sort of brings us to the whole concept of uh, um, Eric Topol retweeted this um, this, uh, this note here, the only radiologists who will lose their jobs to AI will be those who refuse to work with AI. Um, this means you need to shift your focus from worrying about being replaced by a machine to worrying about whether you can add value to a job that you like where a smart machine is your collaborator. And I think that's the stage where we are right now. So how will cardiovascular imaging thrive with AI? First of all, I think there will be more appropriate referrals for imaging. One uh, project we've been working on for a few years is the smart stethoscope. You can record these, upload them to a cloud, they analyze them, and you can see this um, uh, publication here in, in JHA last a couple of years ago 
uh, showed we could detect significant aortic stenosis with an ROC curve of 0.964, uh, and uh, similar results for mitral regurgitation as well. So more re appropriate referrals, more diagnostic acquisitions in diverse settings, easier review, view recognition for auto anatomic interpretation, automated measurements integrating the underlying physics into quantitation, recognition of rare diagnoses. If you don't see something very often, sarcoidosis, you know, having a little bing, think sarcoidosis. Uh, more precise reports with better statements about serial changes. Integration of the imaging into the full patient record, genomics, metabolomics, all of that. More efficient workflow for overworked imagers. Collaborate with referring docs. You've got more time to talk to the people who are managing the patients. And hopefully, home for dinner will be more efficient. So uh, if you think we've hit the wall on computer speed, no, not so much. Uh, won't go into the details here, but uh, this is a quantum computing chip that operates within 1 50th of a degree of absolute zero, but it has increased the speed by, depending on how you do the math, 1.6 billion fold. So once we tame this beast, it will be quite amazing. And these models have only gotten more, uh, more uh, complex. Remember the, the guidance model was down here um, with about uh, 10 million uh, uh, parameters. These new ones like DALI and ChatGPT, they're up in the trillions of parameters in their models. And speaking of, uh, of these DALI, this will allow us to generate art from text. This is teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists in a stream punk style. And this is what it came up with there. And then ChatGPT, you've seen ChatGPT in the news. It can generate text on just about anything. Just don't ask it if you should kill yourself because it may give you advice on how best to do that. But I offered it a challenge over the weekend. I said, write a haiku expressing gratitude to the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center for inviting me to lecture on artificial intelligence in cardiovascular imaging. Now that's a, that's a big ask. There's a lot going on there. Try to get that into 17, 17 syllables. So here's what it came up with. In Houston's great heart, grateful for the chance to share AI's imaging, which I think is pretty good, you know? It's quite remarkable that it just comes up with that. Speaking of, of learning, if this has piqued anyone's interest and you really want to get into the deep weeds of artificial intelligence, climb down into that Python trench and start coding yourself, we offer a fellowship in artificial intelligence and cardiovascular disease. Uh, with my um, uh, co-director, Chris Hammond, up in the computer science department there, and uh, uh, we would love to have you join us. We have found that, um, uh, you know, it helps us bridge the divide between engineers and clinicians. The engineers come up with some grand idea, this is going to change everything. It gets to the clinicians, they say, this is totally useless, we will get away from that with the AI fellow bridging the gasm between those two. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for a really elegant and outstanding presentation. And one point to emphasize is that the system will soon replace the doctors who do not use the machine so we have to live together. Yes. Uh, questions from the audience. Jim, that was fantastic. Really, a, uh, and also very optimistic about the future, which I think uh, you, you addressed it in the last uh, few slides there of the concern, physicians, sonographers, technicians, as to what their role would be down the line, and embracing this is, is amazing. And thinking about e imaging, echo, uh, would benefit probably the most of AI because it is a um, it is a, tech, a handheld technology driven as opposed to 3D driven like MR or, or CT. And I think you've covered very nicely that the acquisition is improved nowadays. 
uh, an initial overall interpretation. I think the amazing thing in ECHO, at least, is we have so much information that even the human at times may not be able to absorb all of it. That's right. And to me, <clears throat> even the most important thing and get your, your is putting all this together from a prognostic point of view for a patient. So we're seeing so many things, and so we can't put it really together, but ultimately for the clinician, it would be very advantageous to put all what you see and you may not see yes. into, into a, uh, a risk. Yeah, what do you no, think? I think that that is very well stated, and, and um, how this will be integrated into our daily reads and things like that, I think will be, will be fascinating. And it, you, know, you know yourself, as you're reading echoes, there's a certain number of them that are really quite normal. They're, you know, they're obtained for palpitations or something like that. If, if the AI could pre-read that and say, these six over here are pretty normal if you wanna just spin through them, get through that, this one you need to study, spend your time on that one there. Uh, so I think that's, that's true, and the, the, the big companies are beginning to gobble up these AI companies. The, the company that had the, um, the AI guidance, it was acquired by GE last week, and so they are gonna, you're going to see the guidance probably in 100 countries by uh, the time they're done with it there. So I think it is, it is getting out into the community. Steve? Jim, th thank you. That was a masterful presentation of a very complicated topic. Um, mm -hmm. So I love the history all the way through to the application. Question, I'm interested in your thoughts on sort of how this will affect ultimately payers and billing in that sphere. So there's some new tech add-ons. Um, the thinking is that new tech generally gets incorporated into the box. The hospital buys the box. It makes us more efficient. But there's actually precedent in the AI field for the software, if you will, be becoming a provider and actually billing. And this is evident in some of the uh, ophthalmology worlds where, you know, computer scans will look at the retina and actually, mm -hmm. through the primary care doc, bill directly and, and sort of cut the ophthalmologist out of the loop. So what's your sense of sort of what's developing in that sphere and how is CMS going to view this and incorporate this? Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating um, uh, question there. And I think for the most part in cardiovascular imaging, most of the approvals that have been gone, that have gone through have been for computer-aided diagnosis. So it, it estimates an ejection fraction, but ultimately it is a cardiologist that says, um, yes, that's, that's an EF of 58%. Uh, but, but I think you're quite right. I mean, the retina scan is an excellent example where it sees things that the, you know, the, the doc doesn't recognize there, and it's really doing better. Uh, I will say it is much harder, uh, FDA is much happier approving something that is assisting the doctor as opposed to replacing the doctor there just because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a higher level of, of surety that it, it needs to see that, but, um, you know, as we, move forward, I, I think that, I think a good example will be the, the HEFPEF detector, because that really is, is coming up with features that your eye might or might not have picked up, and, and are you going to be willing to call someone HEFPEF just on the basis of a high HEFPEF score with this algorithm? And we shall see. All right, well thank you so much for your attention. And thanks for everyone watching online.